Imagine a life without fear, completely fearless. Doesn't that sound wonderful? But is it really what we want? And is it even attainable? I don't know about you, but my greatest fear is losing the people I love. Working as a cinematographer, I have sometimes covered humanitarian crises or conflict areas where I've witnessed the worst of that fear come to be. Last year in Mozambique, the impact of Cyclone Idai left thousands without a home, having lost loved ones overnight. Those in the city of Beira saw most of it destroyed. Others in rural areas observed the entirety of their crops for the year flood and sweep away. Many populations were inaccessible for weeks. People were handling mountains of pain, no food, no electricity, somehow having to figure out what happened. I can still vividly recall an interview with a woman in a refugee camp in Iraq. Now she explained to me that her husband had strangled their nephew for being too loud while he was sexually assaulting him. She looked like a shadow. In 2013, I covered one of the world's largest killings of demonstrators in a single day in recent history, the Rabba massacre in Cairo. I followed several protesters for weeks prior, normal people like you or I, until that day, August 14th. And it was at that moment where, in the midst of all the chaos, a switch went off. And people who had lost family members, or maybe their best friend, started saying things like, now I'm gonna show the government what terrorism really looks like. Now I am willing to die for the cause. Many of the people in these stories might appear as though they had no fear. But that was simply a reaction to the losses and the trauma they'd been exposed to. They felt they had nothing more left to lose or to give. And their natural survival instincts were completely drowned by the grief. I have a colleague and dear friend who said to me, you know, I would much rather work in a conflict zone than go back to my family home. It is so suffocating there that I'd rather operate in a war zone. The first time I went out on assignments and bullets were flying, I was scared. And my adrenaline was riding a roller coaster. But I also realized that it didn't feel as unnatural as I would have expected. So I took a pause and did a bit of soul searching and realized that I'd grown up in a complex family with a volatile home in an unpredictable country, Mexico, where bullets did sometimes go flying and we all had to proceed as normal. Maintaining a high level of alertness was a part of the landscape. I'm sure this can come in handy, very much so in moments of extreme pressure, but it doesn't mean that you're fearless. It simply means that you've been exposed to fear a lot and you've learned how to work with it. It's amazing how we will continue to gravitate towards the familiar relationships, lifestyle, line of work, until we truly decant whatever hangups we're carrying in our backpack. And it's only once we do that that we can truly operate from a place of wholeness, knowing full well that we are capable of overcoming challenges, but most importantly, gaining tools that are better for our life and more powerful than fearlessness, courage, resilience. One of the hardest conversations I ever had was telling my father that I had been raped. What made matters worse is this had happened with a family member. Let me introduce you to my first cousin. He really was a lovely person. He was great at business. He went to an Ivy League school, got married, had a daughter. And to this day, I just cannot understand what got into him because I had been raised to look up to him as an older brother, as an only child. That was really tough. And the worst part of that was, I was trying to explain it to my dad. And you know, there's a lot of discourse out there around sexual violence, but not a guidebook on how to reveal something like this to your father. I had a 
pit in my stomach, pins and needles in my head, my hands were shaking. And for a moment, I considered a viable option to just not say anything at all because my fear was going, what if we just don't tell him? In fact, what if we just pretend that this never happened, never tell anyone ever? Sounded good. Till I realized that every time there was a family gathering, maybe Christmas or a dinner, a birthday, I'd need a level of Academy Award acting in order to pull off normality. I'd also have to carry the whole weight of that on my shoulders in silence for a crime I didn't even commit. Nope, I quickly moved on from that idea and decided to tell my best friend. Now, at the time I was in Mexico because I'd been shooting a documentary and he was in Canada, so this happened over the phone. And as soon as I told him, my fear went, Phew, okay, we survived that, but we are absolutely never doing that again. And he very wisely said, you know, the longer you keep this a secret, the harder it will be to speak about. You need to just bite the bullet and start speaking out now. He hung up the phone and said he was calling me back in 10 minutes to make sure that I told someone in Mexico because I needed support then. As soon as he hung up and I heard that silence, it felt loud. And I didn't know if I could do this, to be honest with you. Then I realized, yeah, he's right. I did want to disclose, and this was the best thing for me, so I called another friend and she drove me to her house via a pharmacy where I got a morning after pill. I took two eventually, and that was just in case no doctors were consulted on that decision. But when we got to her house, she dialed my mom's number, put the phone to my ear, and just went, here, just get it over and done with. All alarms are going off in my body at this point. I've got temple palpitations. <laughs> I'm vibrating. I can hardly feel my skin. But somehow, I knew I'd built some form of muscle, granted a very weak one at this point, but just enough to keep going. So I picked up the phone, very reluctantly, and went, Hi, Mom. And as soon as she heard my voice, all she said was, Were you robbed or were you raped? I was shocked. I mean, how does she know? I don't know if this was a reflection of how well my mother knows me or the fact that in Mexico City we are sometimes exposed to a high level of violence. But anyways, I just started crying and somehow got the point across. Now, so far I have been very lucky because I've been disclosing and receiving support. Sadly, it doesn't always go that way and I also had a chance of speaking face to face with my aunt, my cousin's mom, she was my godmother growing up and we were very tight. And unfortunately, she chose to face to face, just point blank look at me and say, I do not believe you. Oh, that hurt. To this day, that hurts. And after that, she proceeded to expunge herself from my life, basically. And a long chain of family members proceeded to do the same, never speaking to me but just deleting me off of social media. You better believe that every single one of those losses was mourned and grieved. But back to my father, now the fear felt real. I mean, what if I lost him too? And what if he decided he didn't want to see me again? We were sitting in the backyard. The sun went down, we didn't even notice in a bench, in the dark. I could have planned this better. Sorry, Dad. But I felt shame and embarrassment. And somehow, we got through. Now, I wish this had been like ripping off a band-aid and that initial sting passes and then it all starts to subside. No, that was not the case. This was different. People were navigating uncharted territory, fighting an inner battle, digesting at their own pace, Everything got too much and one thing led to another and my father ended up in hospital with a stroke and It was most likely caused by stress So now my fear had skyrocketed because now I'm going Okay, 
what if this is how my father dies? And it wasn't long before I found myself going, this is how my father dies, and I have killed him by revealing this information. I never should have done that. This is my fault. This is how the story ends. When you're in the thick of your fear, it is so easy to panic. You know, I was experiencing a level of anxiety, and it's anxiety that is making us dread that hypothetical outcome that may or may not be real. Real fear is meant to protect us and keep us alive. It's triggered by the amygdala in our brain and it can send us into fight, flight, or freeze modes. So if a car skids in your direction as you're walking down the street, so it kicks you into fifth gear. This was not that. This was another kind of fear, which I refer to as my excuses fear. And it's the one that keeps you operating on this high level of vibration and doesn't let you ground yourself. And also, it prevents you from making decisions that could have very positive and lasting impact in your life. So back to the hospital. Luckily, my father did not die that day. In fact, he is very much alive and kicking nearly a decade later. What did happen was that I chose to get help because I just knew that I couldn't deal with this alone. So in therapy, I came to realize but the reaction of my family was actually quite normal for a rather traditional, conservative, Mexican extended family. And this kind of thing happens all over the world every day, sadly. I also came to realize that confronting reality sometimes takes a lot of guts. Not everyone can be ready at the exact same time. Nelson Mandela once said, he never lost. He either won or took a lesson. I was terrified of losing the people I love the most, but I did, and it hurt. So what's the lesson? Well, I think it's really important to remain grateful for all of the moments and memories that we shared together, because those make me who I am today. But it's also okay to draw a line, family or not, and understand that people can be wrongfully occupying in a place in your life that they no longer deserve. It was time to part ways. I was once shooting a documentary in the Sahara Desert with the Tuareg, who are a nomadic tribe in the desert. And they have lots of crosses in drawings and patterns and embroidery, jewelry. And I wrongfully assumed that this must be a religious thing until I sat down with one of them and he said, oh, no, 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 these lines are arrows. This is you, and this is everyone else you're going to meet in your life. You need to learn to appreciate that intersection because it could last a moment or a decade. But in the end, you're on your life's journey and they're on theirs. And it's important that you welcome the moment that you have to part out of respect for each other's direction. I thought that was beautiful. And reframing our greatest fears it's not only, possible, not, not only possible, but taking charge over them to author our life's novel is almost like a human right in my mind as creatures of reason and creativity. Sure, we all get some miserable cards dealt at one point or another, but the reality is that we get to decide whether to play them, burn them, magic trick them, fold, or keep them close to our chest. Transforming hardship and to fuel, to motor us forward, is entirely done by choice. Now, my aunt once told my parents that they had to find a way to keep me silent because if people found out about what happened, it would destroy my life. That was very much her fear because speaking out about this allowed me to lose the fear of people finding out the big secret. And I was also able to empathize and connect with people on a much deeper level than I had before when they'd gone through similar things. I was able to put my skills to the test and use my creativity and technical abilities to create a multimedia exhibition addressing the impact of rape alongside 24 other rape survivors. I wrote a book on it, but most importantly, I regained my confidence. See, 
Fear and anxiety could have prevented me from having an incredibly beneficial outcome. So now the big question is, what is it that truly petrifies you, that you know is a roadblock in your life? That which your intuition knows, man, if only I could get over this, I would feel such freedom. It doesn't have to be extreme. It could be as simple as the fear of saying, I love you, or I'm sorry. In my line of work, cinematography and visuals, it is impossible to compose an image without having the presence of both light and darkness. They're forever entwined. One cannot exist without the other. And I have always loved how this is a real metaphor for life. Because had we not the dark, painful moments, we would be unable to really enjoy those bright moments that feel like perfection. And had we not the fear, we would not be able to understand that we're able to face it, navigate through it, and come out stronger the other side. Sure, it's not a linear journey all the time, because today I'm strong, tomorrow I'm not, and in a few more days the stakes have changed. But as long as we can continue taking those little steps forward, just like making those phone calls, it all works like building blocks. Teddy Roosevelt once said, and I am paraphrasing here, it is not the critic who counts. It's not the guy pointing fingers at you, saying how you stumble and how you could do things better. Don't listen to those guys. It's about actually standing into the arena of your life and trying and failing and trying again because there's no effort without error. And I tell you what, there's no self-confidence without conquering a fear. So have a look around your life, observe whatever darkness might be there, befriend it. Understand whether it's there to protect you or prevent you from something. Figure out whether you need to adjust your sails or stay firm on the course, no matter the tempests. And as you're navigating through the depths with nothing but the crumbling bits of your very last nearly used up match and the broken compass, just remember all the answers are within. We are all born with an inner light and wisdom. All we have to do is pause, listen to that intuition, reframe if we have to, and let that guide the way. Thank you.